All right, guys. How's up? How's everybody doing? Good. Good. I want to take a look this morning at uh, a brief look at the life of Abraham. Everybody know who Abraham was? Old Abe. Go ahead. Who's Abraham? I just learned about this like Tuesday. Um, wasn't he? Okay, the caucus came up with a decision. What is it? Okay, so um, wasn't he Abram? His wife was not able to give birth to kids, but his but God, he had asked God like, can we like we don't have kids? Can we have kids? And God was like, we're gonna give you kids. And um, when he was waiting to have a kid, he he decided to take it upon himself to have his own kid. Ooh. And um, oh, and because he wanted to like bless that kid. Uh, when he had the kid, God was like, no, I'm going to give you a kid. And then he gave him, Isaac was his name? Yeah. Or was Isaac the first kid? Isaac yeah. wasn't the first kid, but Isaac yeah. was the so kid Isaac of the covenant. Isaac was the kid that so, God gave him. So, so there you go. pretty decent, pretty, pretty good. All right. But uh, part of what we want to look at today, too, is the fact that <laughs> Abraham carries the title, the father... Of what? Many. many, yeah, many nations. The father of, of, of our faith, Father Abraham, right. uh, is basically a model of what faith really is in walking with God. And so the major religions, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, <laughs> all ascribe and look at Abram or Abraham. And in that process, what goes on is that in the Jewish and in the Christian tradition, in the scriptural tradition, Abraham is a model of what it is to have faith and walk with God. And so I want to touch on that this morning, and I'm not going to read a whole ton of things, but I want, I want you to open up your Bibles to Genesis 12, and we're going to walk through a process here of, of things that took place in Abraham's life. Now, one of the things that you've got to understand in this time period is, uh, and, and this is also a principle of interpretation, by the way, when God speaks to people, he speaks to them in the culture that they're in that they can understand. So we're going to look at a couple of issues this morning, and, and I'm going to give you the cultural background as well as how that applies in the, the situation of what we're talking about uh, this morning. Okay, so here's, here's where we're going to start at, and it's going to be chapter 12, which is the call of Abraham. Now, part of what you have to understand, if you look up a little bit in 1131, Terah took Abraham his son, and Lot, the son of Haram, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his sons, Abram's wife, <clears throat> and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Cana. But when they came on Haran, they settled there. Now, the days of terror were 205 years, and terror died in Haran. Now, when they left, okay, um, they, they left Ur the Chaldees. Now, Ur was one of the most sophisticated modern cities of the time. It would be like living in Detroit, or Grand Rapids, or New York, okay? It's a scenario where where they're at is culturally advanced and scientifically advanced. And so they left that to go on their way to another area, but they stopped at Harem. And that's where basically they, they decided to kind of like, we'll make it there and we'll make this our new town, our new ability of, of life. Now, the situation is that if you are in a comfortable place, okay, let's, let's look at it from a modern perspective. All right, how many of you got running water? How many of you got a bathroom? How many of you got plenty of food? How many of you got to go to school? 
Ooh, that one didn't go over too well. All right. So, so the scenario is that you live in a very advanced place. And it would be like God calling you to go out in the middle of nowhere where there's no running water, no food, no nothing, and no school. How about that one? All right, everybody's smiling now. All right, so here's the scenario. He's being called out by God. Let's take a little bit of a look at this at 12. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house. That means you're totally going to leave everything behind. You're leaving your family behind. And you're venturing out, okay? And he says, uh, To a land that I will show you. Now here's a scenario which I think is really interesting. God is talking to him and telling him, move out. And I'm going to show you where you're going to move. But I'm not telling you exactly where yet. How many of you would buy that? Okay, as a situation. You know, it'd be like, it would be like your dad or your grandfather saying, hey, we're going to move. Well, where are we moving to? I don't know yet, but we're moving. How many of you would think that things are really secure there and really great? But it's God that is telling him this. A land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make you great. So that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And, cur and, and with him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. Isn't that kind of a cool calling? And so you get this situation of the call. And it breaks down into six things again. He gets the call and he's told to go. He's not told where to go, but he's saying that I'm going to show you where to go. That you're going to be a nation. That you're going to be a blessing. That I'm going to make your name great. That those that are going to come against you, I'm going to curse. And later, he's going to show them where they're going to arrive. Okay, so the situation is, here's the call. And when the call comes, he packs up. And he gets going, and he moves, and he winds up in Egypt. Now, if you had a promises like that, wouldn't you think God is walking with you, and things are going to be kind of cool? So, there's a famine that takes place in the land. And when the famine takes place in the land, they wind up in Egypt. Now, this mighty man of faith, all of a sudden, is struck with something that becomes actually his first problem is Egypt. He has a promise. He's walking in the promise. He gets to Egypt, and the first thing he says to his wife is, Now, now, Sarah, just let's do a favor here. Uh, I think that uh, here's what we need to do. You're, you're my half-sister, you know, and, and the situation is you tell everybody that you're my sister. Has anybody got an idea why he's saying that? What was the cultural thing that happened in those days? Yeah, if you're a beautiful woman, and it's described that she was a beautiful woman, the, the, the deal was that if somebody wanted the beautiful woman, they would kill the husband. And so his, this mighty man of faith, right from the beginning, right from his first problem, chickens out and says, hey, you're my sister. Okay? God delivers them from that. You think that was a pro, you think that that was a growth uh, step? In faith? Not, not really, okay? So, the, the situation is such like in 13, okay? He's with his, his lot, and the two of them are having some real problems. This is chapter 13. And so what happens is, the second problem is lot. They grow, they get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then they have fights that are going on between Abram's servants, Lot's servants, Abraham goes, look, dude, we're having problems. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to separate. And if you go to the right, I'll go to the left. You go to the left, I'll go to the right. But the land can't keep us both. They were, in, they were enriched that much. And so Abraham's choice was to follow God, but Lot's choice was more of an economic one. Lot looked and he saw, what city do you think he saw? Yeah, Sodom. And it looked like it would be really a prosperous place for business. So what takes place? He says, I'm going to go there and, and I'm going to go to the Sodom. And when he says, I'm going to go to Sodom, what happens is that 
They split, they go in different directions. God says, again, he affirms his promise to Abraham. Okay? And then there's a slight little problem because Sodom gets attacked. Abram takes his servants. They go down, they rescue Lot. Great victory. Everything is terrific. At the end of that victory, he happens to go meet a guy by the name of Melchizedek, the prince or the priest, rather, of Salem, the priest of, uh, of Salem. And what he does is he gives him 10% of the spoils. And things are going kind of cool, and I want you to turn to 15, chapter 15, because this is where it gets really dicey. All right? He's got a promise. He's been victorious. Things are going kind of okay. And it says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my household, Eliezer of Damascus. Um, he's going to be the heir, okay? And Abram, said, uh, and Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring. A member of my household will be the heir. Now, but why is this important? Because, here's the thing, they had servants, they had people that were in charge. The chief of Abram's uh, wealth was this guy that he mentions here. If you had no children... He was going to be the one to inherit everything. So here's the deal. How can I be the father of many nations if I don't have a kid? Genesis right? And, and this guy is going to inherit it. All right? And so here's the deal. God is, is in a situation where Abraham is doing a little... How many of you have ever complained to God? I mean, I don't know. You know. It's just one of those things. You know, it's sort of like, Lord, you know, you're telling me all of this stuff. Hey, what's the deal? You know, how is this all going to come true? How many of you have heard things from God about what your future is going to be like, but you do the same thing? You go like, how is this going to come true? I don't see any evidence of this thing happening. I don't have any kid. Stuff is really bad. Sarah's beyond her years. It's a mess, God. What are you going to do? What's the sign? Okay, now here's what gets interesting, and here's where it's going on. If you had that type of promise, and you look here, where he's complaining in verse 3, you're not, you're not giving me any offspring. And behold, verse 4, the word of the Lord came to him, this man shall not be your heir, your very own son shall be your heir. An impossibility, right? And then he goes on and he says, uh, and he brought him outside and said, look toward the heaven and the numbers of the stars. Uh, you're going to number them. And he says to him, so shall your offspring be. And then verse 6, is very important. What does verse 6 say? Let's read it together. And, and he, he what? Believed. He believed the Lord and he counted it righteousness. Okay? Now, when this happens, what this is going on is that Abraham believes God. Now, that isn't a situation of like, yeah, I believe you, Lord. It's a situation that brings in conviction. And what is taking place with this, this is becoming the foundation of our faith and salvation in Jesus Christ. This is the key to your salvation. Is what God is telling you true or not? Y'all catching it? Because there's two foundational things we've seen so far. Last week it was Genesis 3.15 about the serpent and about Christ, and about the promise of the gospel, this is a promise that has the means of obtaining that promise, even in the Old Testament. All right, now, what's the difference? Everybody wake up, here it comes. What's the difference between religion and a relationship? Well, religion can be tradition. What else can religion be? What you believe in. What you believe in? Yeah. All right, so everybody believes certain things, right? But how is that different than having an actual relationship with God like he is having? He's talking to God. God is talking to him. 
How is that different than religion? Because you get closer to God, you have a relationship. All right. You get closer to God, you have a relationship. Anybody else? How is this different? This is really important for us in this time period that we live in. Because a lot of people believe things and believe that they're going to go to heaven. heaven, right? But the issue is not what you believe, but how you have a relationship with God. Or if what you believe is real. Or if what you believe is real to you. See, there's a difference. This is what I want to get across to you this morning. There's a difference between belief and conviction. Okay? A difference between belief and conviction. Now, a typical story that's told about is this guy. How many of you have ever seen Niagara Falls? Anybody here seen Niagara Falls? Niagara Falls is this big, gaping waterfall. I mean, it is huge. You can see the, the you can hear the rush of the water. Well, there was this guy who had a had a wire extended from one side of the falls to the other, and that wire was nice and taut, and what happened is he walked a tightrope on that wire. In other words, he walked across the falls by just holding a pole, a pole, um, a, a, a pole and walking literally across the, the, um, the falls. And everybody thought that was a great thing. Wow, man, that, that dude, that guy can walk. That's really great. That's fantastic. And he says, well, how many of you believe that I could get a wheelbarrow and walk across the falls with a person in that wheelbarrow? Everybody went, yeah, we think you can do that. And he said, then here's the next question. Who's going to go in the wheelbarrow? <laughs> Yeah, I believe that you can do that. Okay, where's conviction coming? Conviction comes in by you getting in the wheelbarrow. Hello? And there's a world of difference between believing something and getting in the wheelbarrow. Are you all there? You all hearing what I'm saying? How many of you now would want to get in the wheelbarrow? Oh, come on, you guys. Nobody here would want to get in the wheelbarrow? How about you, Jesse? You want to... You would rather walk across? No, no, it, no, no. I'll just watch someone else. <laughs> see, see, and, and 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 this is very important for you to understand because when we talk about faith, faith without conviction is not going to produce the 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 type and and the means within you to really sustain you in your faith. I mean. If we, if we take a look at what, 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 what's happened here, he gets this thing, he believes God, and the sun goes down, look at 12, the sun is going down, and God has already commanded him to take a, a heifer, okay, he says a heifer, a female goat, three years old, a ram, and a turtle dove, and what he does to the animals is he cuts them down the backbone, except for the birds, and he stacks them up like this. And then he waits. And then God brings about, look at this in verse 12, a deep sleep falls upon him. And then what happens is God and him walk in a figure eight through those halves as the blood is dripping on them. And what is happening in this is that they have formed a covenant. Now, you might think, this is pretty barbaric, right? Every, all you animal lovers out there, I'm seeing you cringe right now, all right? No, but the so situation bad. is that in that culture, that's how a covenant was made. There was blood sacrifice involved. There were, um, uh, there were things about the blessings and the curses, and you see this in here. And, and the thing about that covenant was, it was for all generations. Some of you remember, we talked a little bit about this on Monday night. If you make a covenant with someone, all right, if I make a covenant with Jesse, or if I make a covenant with Ken, or Jerry, or, or anybody, the descendants of our families would still be bound by that covenant. It 
what's important about this is this is the foundation of faith. So the covenant that he is making with God, who is part of that covenant today? Oh, yeah. yeah. See, when you come into faith, that covenant is even still now in effect as we come into that covenant as believers. <clears throat> Alright, here's the deal. Alright, we are Jews. We follow Christ in a covenant. And then when we look at like Galatians or Ephesians, there is now one family of God, both Jew and Gentile. And we have entered into this covenant, okay? And he had problems along the way. His faith was tested all the way up <laughs> to chapter 22. Let's turn to 22. This all making sense to y'all? By this time, he has a son. And, and what's important about that is he's had another son before this by a woman called Hagar. Because what was going on was that his wife was saying, I'm still barren, there's no kid, go take my handmaiden and build a child through her. And this was very popular in the culture. And so this is how you can become God's little helper. Because what takes place is God gives you a promise and you run ahead of him. And you muck the waters up really bad. It's the difference between having something good and having something the best. And so by this time what has happened is his son Isaac is about like 20 or so old, years old. He's not a little kid. And this is what God says. He says, um, he says to him, uh, Abram, and he, says, um, he said to him, I'm here, verse 2. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt sacrifice on one of the mountains, of which I will tell you. Now, you've got to understand the fullness of the covenant, and th he is the manifestation, this kid is the manifestation of the covenant of God, and God is telling him, go sacrifice him. In other words, everything that Abraham wanted to see, the evidence that Abraham wanted to see that God was really with him is in this child. And he says, go sacrifice him. Sometimes, folks, you need to sacrifice the situation that you think God is calling you to and allow him to take over. They go up to the mountain, and as they go up to the mountain, his son says, well, where is the sacrificial lamb? Where's the sacrifice? Since we're sacrificing something, where is it? It doesn't dawn on him yet until they get to the mountain and his father ties him and gets ready to kill him with a knife. And at that point, when he's ready to thrust it into his son, God speaks to him. An angel comes and says, no, now I know that not only you believe, but that you have conviction. Now let's turn to Romans, the third chapter, and bring a New Testament concept into this whole thing that we're looking at this morning. You see, what I want to try to get across to you is the fact that it's Romans chapter 3. It, it is not enough just to come to the altar or make a profession of faith and then live your life just like nothing ever happened before. Okay? Because what takes place is this. When you come to Christ, it's a whole new situation. It's a whole new situation. Your life is no longer yours. Amen. Okay? And, and he says here in 21 of chapter 3, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law Although the, um, apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there's no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's verse 23. 
And so here's what's going on with this, okay? What is going on with this is that the law, and there were three parts to the law. There was the ceremonial, there was the civil part of the law. Those laws were laws of Israel, but the moral law, the Ten Commandments, are still standing. And so the situation is such that the moral law is testifying against us. It defines what our sins are. It, it is the Word of God. It is like the, the Word of God is sharper than any what? Two-edged two -edged sword. And it cuts right down to the bone and the marrow. And so we have this situation of our sin being openly exposed and defined by the law. But how are we to get through this problem of being in a scenario where the law is condemning us constantly? The guilt, the shame that we have with it. So he's talking about this. Look at verse 24. He says, The short of the glory, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God put forth as a propitiation. In other words, the very point of forgiveness by his blood to be received by faith. It is through the blood of Christ that we receive forgiveness. And so what is he going to use as an example here to amplify what he's talking about? And so turn over to chapter 4. Chapter 4 says this, when we, What shall we say then was gained by Abram, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast, but not before God. For the scripture says, Abram believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. You see the same parallel of what we saw back in the Genesis passage, right? Now to the one who works, his wage is not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him, justifies ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of uh, the one who, to whom God counts righteous apart from works. Let me ask you a question. How many of you, how many of you work in one form or another? All right. Yes, yes. How many of you kids work? Not yet. Not yet. All right. Ah, some of you work. Where's Samuel? Samuel here? Samuel, are you working? In the summertime. Do you do you expect money for mowing lawns? Yeah. What <laughs> have you ever gone to someone whose lawns you've mowed and doesn't get you it doesn't give you money? Um, no. Not yet, right? How many of you are identifying with what I'm talking about? You go to work to get what? Money. Money, greenbacks, bucks. Greenbacks. <laughs> right? And, and it is not a favor because you contracted to work and receive money in return for that, right? Yeah. And, and so what's going on here is what he's saying is, it is not by the works that you receive this foundation of faith. Because Abraham's righteousness was not based on his works, it was based on his faith. There is a tendency in Christian circles that is, I call it easy believism. What I mean by that is people say a lot of things that they believe, just like the guy on the high wire saying, Are you going to get in the wheelbarrow or not? I am. A I lot of say, people. Would you get in the wheelbarrow if it was me? Like, if I was pushing it, would you get in the wheelbarrow? Not if you were pushing it, that's for sure. <laughs> We wouldn't get two feet, you'd probably fall right off. I have big feet, so. What was, what was that? So I have good. big feet. You have big feet, so do I. The, the, the situation is really such, look at this, guys. The situation is really such as this. Do you, are you really convicted that what you believe is true? Are you really convicted that... Everything in here is true. 
See, because there's a lot of folks that look at it and basically say, yeah, I believe this, I believe that. In the book of James, it says that even the demons believe that Jesus is Lord. What's that? They tremble. Though. They tremble, yeah. Why do they tremble? Because they, they, they are convinced and convicted that their doom and destruction comes through the blood of Christ. It's very easy for an individual just to say, I believe. It's another thing that that belief bring you into a conviction of your lifestyle, of the way you behave, of what your morals and ethics are. That is very important. And so what I'm emphasizing this morning, it's not enough to say, yeah, I made a commitment at the altar and live your life just like nothing happened. And it's very easy to read the Bible and read it as if it's fiction, just like The Hobbit. But the situation is such that it, that is not the direction of what's being called for here. What's being called for here is that we go beyond belief and bring about conviction. If you believe that you believe that what is in this book is true, then it should have an effect on how you view the entire world. What you view on Facebook, or TikTok, or Top Tick, or whatever you want to call it. I'm being very serious about this, because a, a Christian should live according to the conviction that what's in this word is true, and view the world through that conviction. Not through what you see on the TV, or what you see on the Facebook, or any other of the social media. How many of you realize... 90% of what's on social media is stupid, right? How many of you seen these challenges? They pour ice on top of them and all this other stupid stuff, all right? I'm telling you, particularly you young people, there is a, there is a purposeful um, a push to make you believe things that are contrary to this book. Yes. And what you have to understand is this book is true and fake book is not. This book is true and what you see a lot of times on the news is not. And this book is the guidebook upon which you just don't believe it. You need to have conviction for it. And so for what I'm calling you guys to today is very simply this. Stop believing and start having conviction about what you believe. Now, that isn't always going to be the easiest thing. How many teenagers do we have here today? Yeah. yeah. All right. How many of you realize about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Have you ever heard of these dudes? These are the guys that were brought from their land into a foreign land and they were being invested in by Nebuchadnezzar to be the future leaders, to be brainwashed, to live just like the Babylonians did, and then send them back to their old land so that they could rule the same way the Babylonians did. Only it didn't work out so well when you read the book of Daniel. They, they, they had this idol, and what was going on is when the trumpets were sounding and everything, everybody was supposed to bow down to this idol, except there were three teenagers that said, no, dude, we ain't doing that. We believe in our God, and we are so convicted about the belief that we have in our God, we will not bow down. And the penalty for that was to be thrown in a fiery furnace. Okay? A hot, fiery furnace. And they said, we will not bow down. And furthermore, what they said, our God will deliver us. And even if he doesn't deliver us, we ain't doing this. Hey guys, how many of you would be standing? And they got thrown into the fire. You all know this story. You probably heard it, you know, when you were just about... We hide to a grasshopper. But the fact of the matter, the story, the whole book of Daniel is talking about conviction and application and faith. They were willing to die for what they knew was true. And we need to be in that same mindset 
looking at the world through the, the vision of the scripture, looking at the world through the way that the scripture defines it, and standing on that, even if it means going through the fiery furnace. The scripture that says that if you deny me, I will deny you before my heavenly Father. Remember that? Jesus talking about that? It's a time to take a stand, folks. But that is rooted in understanding your faith, just like Abram did when he became Abraham, the father of many nations. That covenant is alive for us today. When we come to Christ, it is through that covenant, that door, in faith, believing that what's in this book, that what Jesus taught us, what the Holy Scripture teaches us, is absolutely true, and we are convinced of that even to the point of death. And there are people your age, all of you, that are living in a world today where taking that stance means death. <coughs> if you live in the Middle East, the Arabic term or the Arabic word that begins with N as Nazarene defines you as a Christian, and that gives you a one-way ticket to execution in some cities where um, Islamic law and a, living in an Islamic state will get you killed for being a Christian. Our brothers and sisters of all of our ages are under that currently today. If that comes to your doorstep, will you stand, even if it means giving up your life? That's how serious salvation really is. It's not just a simple thing of God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and you put it on a poster and lift it up in a football game. It's a situation of taking serious what God is telling you. And like Abraham, a lifelong journey without knowing exactly where it's going to wind up. You know, when people get married... Everybody thinks about wonderful things are going to happen and everything. But when a couple stands before you and I, and the preacher gives the word and goes through the ceremony, there are no guarantees there. And that couple has no guarantee of what their life is going to be like or what life may bring. I did a wedding for a couple, and less than a year later, the woman died of a rare disease. There's no guarantees, folks. The only guarantee we have is our conviction in Christ and our belief in laying down our life for him. Let's pray. Father, I pray that each and every single one of us will take a stand, Father, that we will no longer just let our faith drift from one side to the other. But, Father, just like Abraham, just like Jesus and, and many others, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Father, I pray for each one that our belief turns into conviction. That in the days of challenge, in the days of darkness, as well as in the days of joy and praise, that we will have the conviction that you will be with us even as we go through this life and the trials that come along with it. Father, strengthen each and every one's faith, Lord, from the youngest to the oldest, that we may walk a walk with you, just like Abram, and listening, Father, to what you have for us and the revelation and the, the joys, and listening to you, Father, when the darkness comes, that, Lord, that we may be like Abraham, looking for a city whose builder and foundation was God. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.